bring this week. And w one of the things that uh, we, we kind of concluded our study on the spiritual gifts. Um, and actually, one of the things that I want to do a little bit later in the summer, early fall, is uh, do a purpose-driven life. Um, there's a, a, a curriculum that goes along with that. And if you've never done that, if you've never read the book, it's a fantastic book. But I'd like to do that as a church. There are a few organizational things that go along with that, like getting people books and, and, and setting it up and those sorts of things. So I was thinking about a transition. And one of the things that's come up fairly consistently in some of our discussions in the church is communication. And that can function on a lot of levels. Oftentimes, one of the things we focus on is just when a miscommunication happens, you know, when word doesn't get out, um, like maybe, maybe somebody will show up at 11 o'clock, you know, <laughs> they, um, things like that. But there's a lot to communication and what scripture has to say about it. Um, some of the things address stuff like that, but a lot of that's practical matters. Um, and part of the reason I wanted to focus on that is, um, you know, I, I myself have had some false starts in communication in the church. You know, I, I'm learning who people are, um, learning how best to get in touch with people, learning that some people don't text, learning that some people don't look at Facebook, those sorts of things. Um, but it, it's not even about that. It's that over the coming year, and, and I'm starting to see some of the energy here with people coming up with ideas, we'll probably be encouraging people and ourselves to, to stretch ourselves, and that almost guarantees that we'll have communication issues. So I thought, okay, this will be a good short series for us to, to begin on. So today is unusual in that it has a little bit of an intro where we look at just some general uh, issues, but then the primary issue in the second half of it is really the issue of communicating the gospel. Because that's one of the challenges, I think, that is in front of our church. It's for each of us to engage in sharing the gospel with our neighbors and with people out there in the world. I find it particularly challenging. So I, I preach to myself when I preach about this issue. I don't have the gift of evangelism, but like all of us, we're called to sort of do the work of the evangelist occasionally, to, to share the joy that is within us, to share our own testimony. Um, so going to that intro, sort of the broad issues of communication. Um, it, you know, it's something that churches and organizations really struggle with um, consistently. It, I, I said last week it's always a moving target. Uh, I've got some examples from pastoral ministry. Um, it's a moving target on any given morning because A, I'm not a morning person, and there's a fine balance between coffee and, and bladder. Um, <laughs> it's true. If you're going to be in service for an hour, you have to think about these things. Um, there's a fine balance between breakfast with Betty. <laughs> okay, you get the idea. Um, on a more serious note, you know, you might consider, okay, what does God want me to say? That's something that I consider every Sunday. Is there something in particular? Are we headed someplace in particular? And you know what? It's a big book. And, and narrowing that down means listening to God's voice. Um, you think about things like, what does the congregation need? You know, when, when I look out at the congregation, what do we need to move forward and do something great for God and to be satisfied and all those other things? Um, you know, what other parts of pastoral ministry have a priority in a given week? Uh, those can impact communication, what I do here on Sundays, because there are times where there are needs that are simply urgent and important, and they actually can become more important than the Sunday message. You don't hear many preachers say that, but it's true, because we're a community, we're a family, and there are needs, and sometimes that happens. Or, or there's just the consideration of where are we headed, you know? And, and as a message. So there's all those things that can, can go into it. One of the other things is, like, when we're talking about his story, you know, the big story, do you try and cover 15 chapters at a time? I think I learned that no is the answer on that one. <laughs> Does everybody know what I'm talking about? If you don't... <laughs> Um, but there's lessons on communication that um, I've actually learned from the Army. Like I said, we share some commonalities with, with other organizations. One is that when you're communicating, the environment is always changing. There's a constantly changing environment out there. Um, there are constant challenges to communication, those things that are just normal challenges. As a matter of fact, in the Army, there's an entire manual, an AR, Army Regulation 25-5, devoted to Army writing style, and it's that thick. <laughs> Communication is something that everyone struggles with. Um, there's changing technology. Um, military, we have changing personnel all the time. There's actually an enemy. Sometimes it's distance. Well, the thing is, the church has similar things. We have a changing environment, too. We have this digital media. 
we just use digital music, right, to, to make up for not having a pianist today. Uh, but there are other things going on. We've got Facebook. We've got all these other things going on. That's a big change. There's changes in society, changing environment. There's a different focus on the social calendar. There was a time in our nation's history where the neighborhood church was kind of the focus, the social focus. That's no longer true. It hasn't been true for quite a while. So there's this constant changing environment. The change in society, you know, there's different expectations. We compete with things like entertainment and sports, whether it's our kids' sports or whether it's Sunday sports, you know. Um, I almost quoted a song there, I probably shouldn't. So, uh, but <laughs> I can. Sunday sports in your boxer shorts. It's a <laughs> uh, I told you it was an unusual day. Uh, but just like with the Army, we have an enemy, too, who is determined to mess up our communication with one another. He's determined to throw wrenches in the gears, make sure we hear the wrong things from one another, misunderstand each other, uh, all those sorts of things. And then there's our own human nature. Um, and, and we're sometimes easily offended or sometimes we like to gossip, all those sorts of things. And, and like I said, there's the, the fact that there will probably be some new people trying some new things in this church and casting the vision for what, a, what you're doing. That's hard. Or even dealing with the logistics of what you're doing. That's hard. So all these challenges are out there. And so we'll talk about some of those um, in coming weeks. Uh, all those things that are related to human experience and, and just human nature. The Bible has something to say about it. But our first concern, that's content. It's not about the, the process. And, and let's go back to where we have left off. And that's the Holy Spirit. He reveals Jesus. He is Jesus' Spirit poured out. And because of that, we represent him. We share his ministry and message. So our first thoughts ought to be about sharing the gospel because that really is his message. Uh, and, and the thing is, we're not left alone in that. He, we are empowered and transformed. We're transformed first by the Holy Spirit and, and developing fruit of the Spirit in our lives. And then we're empowered to work by his gifts of the Spirit. And that's when we're best able to carry the gospel forward. We're called ambassadors. So actually the standards for the way we communicate are higher than a lot of the practical standards out there for the world. It's because we represent him. So since we communicate the gospel with speech, as I've just spoken too much, um, let's talk about speech in general. There's a couple of cautions about speech that are put out there. In James 3, um, verses 1 through 12, it says, We all stumble in many ways. Anyone who is never at fault in what they say is perfect and able to keep their whole body in check. What this is telling us is that none of us actually achieve it. The goal of communicating and speaking properly, you know, according to God, as God's chosen and as God's claimed, is something we never completely manage to do. We all go astray at some point. And the verse goes on and says, when we put bits in the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. Or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder <clears throat> wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue also is a fire. A whole a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. Wow. Basically, it's saying there is power for trouble in our tongue, in our speech, far greater than its size implies. The one that sticks out for me is the idea of the boat steered by a rudder because it's talking about a sailboat. I actually learned to sail uh, when I lived in Corpus Christi, Texas. Um, I, I, I lied to the instructor and told him I could swim and then put on a life jacket. Um, and the thing about that little rudder, and you know, on a, on a smaller boat, it might not be any bigger than my hand. And even on the larger ones, maybe not bigger than my forearm. But that thing moves the boat everywhere you need it to go. You can tack and jibe back and forth and do what you need to do. But the thing is, you have to have this keel, and that's a much larger piece, 50 to 100 times the size of that rudder. And without that, holding the rudder in check, the whole thing just moves sideways. It goes off course. We need something to keep our tongues in check. There are second and third order effects, things that we can't see when we speak and when we speak out of turn and we speak in an ungodly manner, and it can be very destructive. 
And the passage goes on. It says, all kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind. But no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. So none of us can do it. That's what it just says here. None of us can tame our own tongue. It's true of all of us. It's part of the fallen nature of all of us. It basically says we're busy taming the world. You know, horses and going after the things that we need, that we want, you know, that, that we accumulate, and we forget to serve God. Our focus is almost always somewhere else. The passage goes on and says this, and this is where there's hope. It says, with the tongue we praise the Lord our F and Father, and with it we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praising and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. So I said there's hope there, but it sounds like it's just telling us that we're inconsistent and we're hypocrites, right? That's true in one sense, but the truth and the hope is found in one of our previous messages. These comparisons are a way of pointing out the difference between what flows from the flesh and what flows from the Spirit. And we've been claimed by God, therefore the Holy Spirit exists within us. When we talked about fruit of the Spirit, what was the key? The key was to focus on God and focus on the Holy Spirit. When we're focused elsewhere, the flesh can reign and all these bad things happen. But when we're focused on God, the fruit of the Spirit develop in our lives. They, can, they start to grow and, and, and we bear more fruit. And you know what? That little rudder is brought under control when we're focused on God, when we're focused and submit to His Holy Spirit. So when we are controlled by the flesh, there's great potential for destruction. But that's why we look to discipleship first. Before we look at spreading the gospel, we look at the gospel's effect on our own life and make sure we are being disciples, make sure that we're in submission and that we're allowing the fruit of the Spirit to develop in our lives. There's some other warnings in there that we'll probably talk about in more depth. Um, but for the church, there are warnings about gossip and slander. And, and you know, slander, that's basically bearing false witness against one another. You know, maybe you think something about somebody, and so you repeat what you heard just because you think, well, that's probably true because there are warnings about doing that. We're not to do it. There's warnings about coarse speech. Some translations um, actually look at that and, and make you think it's about all the swear words, about the four-letter words. <laughs> um, it's not actually about that. It's about speech that degrades those things that God says have value degrading speech towards one another, not recognizing that when you look at the people around you, they're also created in God's image. So that's what coarse speech is, something that degrades those things that God values, including other people. The second point, other than these warnings about speech, is that God speaks first. And that's where we see how it really begins to have an impact on us spreading the gospel. No, it doesn't matter where you look, God speaks first. God spoke first into creation. God spoke first and he said we're each created in the image of God. Not just us, but those around us. The people in the community around us, the people who don't know God, who are fallen, also created in the image of God. This is in the beginning, God created. And John chapter 1 says, in the beginning, the word was with God and the word was God. God speaks first. When God wanted to claim a people for his own, he spoke first to Abraham. Abraham didn't come into the promised land on his own. He didn't make his way on south on his own. He made his way into the promised land and on south and did everything he did because God spoke first. And how about your own personal invitation to faith? When you first became a Christian, was it just a good idea that popped into your head or did God speak first? He spoke first to people before us, and it was printed in Scripture. He spoke first in our hearts. He brought conviction to each of us that we were sinners, that we're broken. That was the first step. Figuring out that we're not the center of everything, right? He spoke first and showed us that he's a glorious God. He is that God of creation. He is that God on the mountain. And because he's that God of glory, and because we have sin in our lives, we're worthy for de of death. He would be totally right, just like the potter and the clay, to just wad us up, start all over again. We know that because he spoke first. 
But because he spoke first, we're also assured that he values us above all else in creation, that mankind was his crowning achievement in creation. He assures us and he pursued us through time. He lets us know that. God spoke first. He spoke first and he revealed a Savior who sacrifices himself for us. And because he spoke first, he also empowers us by his Holy Spirit. So God speaks first before we can make any decision for him, right? So when it comes to the gospel, we need to understand that just as he spoke first in our lives, he is speaking into the lives of those around us. I think that's something we sometimes forget. We lay a lot of pressure on ourselves when it comes to the gospel and think that <clears throat> we bear the burden. But the fact is, if God calls us to speak to somebody and tell them about our Savior, God has been speaking first into their lives, just like he did in ours. I chose a passage here. It's a little bit out of context, but I, I think it makes the point. It says, For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It, it penetrates even to the dividing of soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before his eyes, before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. So when we think about this, if you ever think that God is calling you to speak to somebody, you have faith that the word is active and working behind the scenes on those we're called to share with. Fit for judging the heart. Fit for bringing conviction. Fit for telling them that this righteous God cares for them and has pursued them. Fit for letting them know that he sent his son as Savior. And it's an interesting thing about this whole thing of the word. Sharper than any two-edged sword. Um, that's something that's kind of knit into our culture. There are so many times where you hear people, people quote things, not even knowing it's from the Bible. There's a general revelation out there, too. And that's one of the ways that God is working in these people. Um, it's knit into our culture. We can use it to check not only our own message and make sure that we're on point. It's a good idea if you're sharing a message to make sure it's actually the message, right? It's a good principle of communication. But also to evaluate the circumstances of people around us. How many times do you run into somebody and you see that broken part of their lives and there's something in Scripture that speaks directly to that? So there's the word in the sense of Scripture. Uh, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 says, All Scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. And that includes the work of evangelism, of stepping out and letting somebody know about your Savior. The word has another meaning as well. When it says in the beginning the word was God, uh, the word was with God and the word was God, that word is logos. Uh, it can be directly translated as word, but it also means wisdom. It's the wisdom of God poured out. It's that wisdom that he would bring redemption rather than dis destruction and that he worked it out in the person of Jesus Christ. So that's another thing. When it says... Uh, that the word of God is alive and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, it's that this is the wisdom of God as he's intended it from the very beginning, being worked out in creation. So when we join in, we're joining in something that God has been doing from the very beginning. It's part of his wisdom. And then finally, we have the word in that sense of it being Jesus and his Holy Spirit. In that sense, it's the work that God, that Jesus, that his Holy Spirit is doing right now, here and now. So when we join together, in doing the work of the evangelist, in sharing the gospel, we're not doing it alone. Nothing is hidden. All is uncovered. And God is able to do that in the lives of the people around us. So when we're called to spread the gospel, we're not called to do it alone. He's been speaking to each circumstance. And I chose another passage. Um, it might seem an odd jump, but implied in going and making disciples is the implication that we are to be disciples first. Uh, so I'm looking at James, again, chapter 1. And there's this implied task in evangelism. It's making disciples, but it's also to be disciples. And starting in verse 19, it says this, My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to, peak, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. The point there is if God speaks first, then the first thing we should do is listen. It says, because human anger does not produce righteousness that God desires. If we're setting out to transform people's lives, we need to set out first to be transformed. Listen first. It says, therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent and humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. Uh, 
Looking at, the, at that word planted in you and thinking about that idea, there's, there's a, a passage in Proverbs, we all have heard it. It says, as iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. And most often that's applied to a group of believers. And that's true. We need to listen to one another first. We need to listen for God's spoken word in each other's lives. And then we're able to step out into the lives of others. And as iron sharpens iron, it grows us, it sharpens us, it hones us so that we're able to step out into the world and do good things. So we need to be disciples first and then disciplers. We need to be open to correction, to challenge, and to growth. That's the first task before we step out and make disciples. It says, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forget, forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continue, continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. Place your own discipleship first and it will remind you who you are. Your child claimed by God. And then you'll be blessed in what you do for God's kingdom. And finally, a final point is to, to rest in the word. Um, Hebrews 4, 14, 16 uh, is where we're going with this. But if we listen to God first, and we, first uh, it says, have faith that he is working, speaking into those other lives. Um, I'm sorry, I'm reading the, the wrong part. Um, the context is, um, Hebrews, let's see here, 4, 12, and 13, he talks about the faith of our forefathers and how that's what enabled them to do what they did, that they stepped out in faith and obedience. And he said, when they did that, they were able to enter into God's rest. But when they didn't, when the nation of Israel failed, they didn't enter into God's rest. They didn't enter into the Sabbath. I'm sorry, that was the context. But then... Um, Stepping into our verses, uh, it says, There remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For anyone who enters into God's rest also rests from their works, just as God did from his. Let us therefore make every effort to enter into that rest, so that no one will perish by following their example of disobedience. So these people in the Old Testament, they tried to proceed under their own power, and they failed to be that blessing on the nations that they were intended to be. But when we do, when we proceed under God's power, when we proceed in faith that he will do what he has claimed, we're able to enter into his rest. We're able to accomplish what he asks us to do, and it's not a burden. We find rest in it. So the context of the word sharper than any two-edged sword, it says this, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weakness, but we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are. Yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence. It's basically saying, let us pray that his word will go out so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. I stumbled over that, so I'm going to explain it a little better. We put a burden on ourselves when we go out into the world, right? We try and proceed and we try to do it under our own power. And we struggle. And we wonder why it's not working. We're just like the people of the Old Testament. It says they struggled under their own power and they never entered into his rest. But God's word tells us this. If we submit, if we recognize that we have a high priest who enters into the throne room for us, if we recognize that he has enabled us, that he has empowered us, we can enter into his rest. We can enter into that Sabbath. We can lay claim to it. And we can still accomplish those good works. And that verse where it talks about our high priest then leads into the word is sharper than any two-edged sword. It says when we submit, when we approach the throne of grace with confidence, we may receive mercy to find the grace to help us in our time of need. What is our need right now as a church? I think our need right now is to grow. And you know what? Our need right now is not to grow by transfers. It's not to grow by appealing to somebody who is a, a consumer Christian and wants whatever it is they want. Maybe they, maybe they feel they've got to have a pianist every Sunday and this would be a deal breaker for them. Do we want that? No. Maybe we'll get some good transfer growth. That's fine. People move. Those, are th those things are okay. But what we need is to grow by conversion. We need to grow by bringing salvation into the world, by changing lives. Our need now, 
I think is a confirmation of this calling to seek and save the lost. And it's a calling that each of us have. So four principles. Listen first. Because he speaks first. Listen in faith. Because he speaks with power and authority. Do what he says. He proclaimed a message of salvation. We proclaim that message of salvation that he's given us. And then recognize that the burden is light. If we do those three things, he does the work. It's his Holy Spirit. It's his power. And we're able. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you that we have a high priest. That, Lord God, you go before us. That after you died on that cross and were raised again, that you were lifted up. That you sit at the right hand of the Father. That, Lord God, you are glowing and mighty and righteous. That, as that image presented in Revelation says, your, your tongue is like a two-edged sword. It's that two-edged sword fit for dividing sin and bone, for judging the hearts of men. Lord God, we thank you that as high priest, you do the work. You've asked us to join in. You've asked us to be your ambassadors. And all we need to do is accept who you are and submit. Let your Holy Spirit bring fruit into our lives. Let your Holy Spirit give us the gifting we need to function as your church. Let your Holy Spirit guide us towards people who need your message. And Lord God, once that is done, it's your work. We may not see the harvest in a given moment. We may harvest that which somebody else has planted. But Lord God, the world is ripe for the harvest. I pray that we be your workers. That we step out into this field around us. The Lord God, we give a voice to the hope that rests within us. The Lord God, we share the story of our own joy of our own transformation, that we give a testimony to who you are. Lord God, may your word not go out void. We thank you that we've been called. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.